Changes in Tweed Salmon Runs As is pretty clear to everyone who's fished the Tweed in the last few years, there have been great changes in the types of fish being caught. Autumn runs, both grills and salmon, have declined. Summer salmon have increased and spring has stayed much the same. It's also clear that similar changes are happening on other rivers. And the first question that always needs to be asked about these sorts of large scale changes is have these happened before or are they something new? And this just illustrates the changes we've been seeing. Uh, with some considerable annual variation you can see that July catches have been heading up since about 2000 while November catches have been heading down very sharply except for two very large annual anomalies 2010-2013 there were very large gross catches but these were quite against the general trend the sizes of fish have been changing too. From the 1990s, the July and August fish have been getting bigger. The October and November fish have been getting smaller. Now this is basically because the type of fish that's been caught from July and November has been changing. Back in the 1990s, fish of 7 to 10 pounds were mainly grills. But in more recent years, fish of 7 to 10 pounds have been mainly salmon. The commonest grill sizes have been falling rapidly over the past 20 years and are now about half of what they were in the 1990s. The commonest salmon sizes have also been falling, but this has been because there are many fewer large late autumn salmon now and a lot more small summer salmon. Now these sorts of changes have happened before and over the whole area of the salmon, not just on Tweed. And we can look at that by comparing the proportions of grills and salmon, the ratio of salmon to grills in net catches. And the blue bars in this graph show when there were more salmon than grills in the catches and the red bars when there were more grills than salmon. The black line shows the one-to-one -one equal proportions of both types. So you can see back in the 18th century, which is as far as we've got records back, there were more salmon than grills up to the end of the century. Then we had a long period, 50-60 uh, years in the beginning of the 19th century, when there were more grills than salmon. Then there was a period of sort of one-to-one -one end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries. Then we had more salmon than grills, 1910, 1960, and then more salmon than grills from about 1990. And after that, we have no more uh, netting records. Now that 1910, 1960 period when there were more salmon than grills was of course the, the spring salmon period on the Tweed. And these changes in run timing have big effects on the numbers being caught as well. Uh, here's the, uh, the catches at Sandstow from the 1840s up to 2000. And you can see that the February to June catches, the catches made in the first half of the season or so, became more prolific than the later catches of 1921. And that persisted until 1961 when July to so September catches overtook the early season catches. Now there's big changes in numbers as well as you can see. Uh, back in the 1850s uh, they could be catching 10,500 fish a year. 1960s uh, up to 3,500. And those big, big numbers are gross numbers because it's always grills that give the really big catches. Uh, salmon catches, by contrast, are relatively stable. It's grills that give the big variation. Now, as you can see following the blue line, at the beginning of the 20th century, grills were decreasing very rapidly. And of course, that was noticed at the time. And that's just one quote 
uh, from Calderwood's book of 1909, and you can find many others at the period. People were seriously concerned about the decline and even the possible extinction of grills. And this wasn't just happening on the Tweed, this was happening on the other East Coast rivers, the Spey, the Don, Dee and the Tweed. You can see how the grills high of the first half of the 19th century was common to all the rivers, as was the grills low in the 1920s and 1930s. So that's indicating that these changes are not river specific. They're, they're happening together, so they must be responding to something happening out at sea where all the fish are mingling. So what are the likely future trends? Well, they will be that most grills will come in summer rather than autumn, and they'll be small. That salmon will outnumber grills. Whether they're going to be spring or summer salmon, we don't know. And as salmon have a lower survival rate at sea than grills, numbers will not be as high as in the recent grill speak in the 80s and 90s. That's simply because salmon spend twice as long out at sea as do grills, so they've got the, twice the chance of uh, being lost. Now this shows why grills will be coming back earlier. Uh, this is the proportion of the grills caught in each month, 1840-2000 at Sandstow. And the July proportion is in green, the August proportion in purple, September proportion in blue. And you can see in the 1920s, 1960s, when there were a lot of spring salmon and not so many, very few grills, most of those grills that did come back were coming back in July and rather few in August and September. Whereas you look at the periods before and after that, and you can see there were mainly August and September uh, returns for grills. And when gross numbers fall, as they did in the 1850s and the 1920s, they get smaller. And there's a couple of examples here. First from the rake nets in the River Dee in the 1850s, what was caught in the last month of the season. And you can see the numbers of gross falling to a tenth in about five years, and the weights going down by about two thirds. The same was true during the gross depression in the 1920s and 30s. Average was down to just about four pounds, but as numbers improved again towards the 1960s, these sizes increased. Now, here's a prediction from 1990 made by Tony George, who did most of the work on these long term uh, variations. And he points out that uh, the history of Scottish salmon shows that when a salmon period declines and a growth period comes in, you get, for a short number of years, strong joint runs of both salmon and gross in many large rivers, the last of those being 1957-66. And that is why that catches from that period should never be used as baselines to judge more recent catches against, because that period is quite exceptional, a very different sort of period. Um, but even so, of course, uh, many comparisons are made uh, using the 1960s as baseline for salmon catches. However, he also said that when the opposite happens, when it's a gross period that declines and a salmon period comes in, there's always a significant number of years before the salmon become established. And during such periods, the fishery as a whole is at a low ebb. And that, I'm afraid to say, is the period we're going into. We're seeing the end of a growth period, the beginning of a salmon period, and we must be going through that hiatus, that gap in years before the salmon comes established, when the fishery as a whole is at a low ebb. So what are the causes of these very large scale changes? Well, one idea that it's warmer conditions in the subarctic, in the very North Atlantic, so the fish actually go further north, make a longer migration, and so spend longer at sea. A variation on that is that it's due to the quality of feeding. A warmer uh, northeast Atlantic, which is the grills feeding zone, is poorer feeding, so grills become 
uh, decline in numbers, size and condition. And a variation on that idea is that uh, since the girls don't feed well in their first year, more of them stay at sea uh, to become salmon and in order to get back to the rivers at a reasonable size. And that probably means moving from the northeast, the girls feeding area, to the northwest, the salmon feeding area. And it is in fact the case that the relative proportions of salmon and girls can actually be correlated with large scale changes in the climate. And this requires first of all a consideration of the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation. Basically, atmospheric pressures in the North Atlantic are generally low around Iceland and high around the Azores. And a positive NAO phase represents a stronger than usual difference in pressure between the two regions. And that means you get winds from the west dominating, bringing with them warm air, while the position of the jet stream allows stronger and more frequent storms to travel across the Atlantic. Whereas a negative NAO phase is the opposite, and it's when you've got weaker than usual differences in pressure between the Iceland and the Azores areas. So you get winds from the east and northeast are more frequent, bringing with them cold air, and you get calmer and less stormy weather. Now in salmon terms, that means with a positive NEO, you've got a warm and wet northeast Atlantic, the grouse feeding area, and that's not so good for grouse or their feeding. Whereas in a negative NEO phase, you've got cold and dry in the northeast Atlantic, the grouse area, and that's good for grouse. Uh, there's a website address there uh, for learning more about the NEO. Now, while the NEO varies annually, it has phases when it can settle down to be positive or negative for periods of years. And we can uh, apply one of the earlier diagrams on the ratio of more or ratios of salmon and girls to this. And you can see that indeed in the 18th century, when we had more salmon than girls, it was a positive NEO phase. Then we move into a negative 1800, 1860, we get more girls than salmon. Then we appear to have a breakdown in the system. There should have been, a, going by this, a salmon phase at the end of the 19th century and then a girls phase at the beginning of the 20th. But we didn't see that in the fish record. But then we move into the uh, spring salmon phase of 1910, 1960, which is quite clear. Then the girls phase from about 1970 to 2000 and then moving back into a positive NEO salmon phase uh, more recently. So you can see that in that diagram. Uh, the, the salmon, the girls, the salmon, the girls phases. And then that sort of questionable period, end of the 19th, early 20th century. But actually that can be explained if we look on a different calculation of the NEO uh, the multi-decadal oscillation, not based on tree rings, as that long-term one was, but on more direct measurements. And you see that that questionable period, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries, uh, was not really a, 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 a solid phase. It wasn't really one thing or the other. It was a mix of positive and negative NEOs. And that would explain that period when the salmon and girls were about 50-50. There was no strong environmental driver pushing them to adopt a salmon or a girls way of life. But then we move into a settled phase of positive NAO and we've got more salmon than girls, then more girls than salmon with a settled negative NAO and then moving back more recently into a positive phase with more salmon than girls. Now it's interesting looking back to see how anglers reacted to these changes in the past. So we go to back to 1920, the report from the Tweed that year admitted that it was now a spring river, an exceptionally good spring season, followed by another deplorable autumn. 
1921, they actually say it was the best spring and the worst autumn fishing on record. And they make an interesting point though as well. It says that although the modern season began 1859, <coughs> beginning on February the 1st, spring fishing didn't become a distinct feature of the river till 1911. Uh, so up till then there wasn't really, uh, well, as you find in you look in the old books, there wasn't really much spring fishing on the Tweed. But the point about 1911 is, although that may have been the first proper spring salmon season, it's only happening about 20 years, or I mean 30 years, uh, after the decline of the grills was really beginning to cause serious concern. They ask a very interesting question back in 1921. Who can say why the lively little fish, that is the spring salmon, appear in the river so early in the year and who can tell what they are? Are they delayed grills? If not, the disappearance of grills is another of the puzzling problems connected with the salmon. And that's a very good point because there is definitely some connection between grills and spring salmon. When one is up, the other is down. And you can't really have them together except for those few years when you get a transition from growth to salmon. So that suggests that uh, two possibilities. Either growth and spring salmon are the same fish. They just change their behaviour depending on conditions out at sea. Or are they different fish, different stocks of fish, who expand and contract their spawning areas within the river in response to environmental conditions. We don't know the answer to that. Now last year, 2016, was a very poor year for fresh fish in the autumn. And again you can ask the question, uh, has that sort of thing happened before? Well, just by chance, we have from as long ago as 1618, exactly the same situation. And we can find this in the report by a fellow called John Taylor, who called himself the King's Water Poet. And he visited Berwick in 1618. And he points out, of course, that uh, the Tweed that runs by Berwick is an important salmon river. And that there was an order that no man or boy whatsoever should fish upon a Sunday. But some eight or nine weeks before Michaelmas last, on a Sunday, the salmon played in such great abundance in the river that some of the fishermen, contrary to God's law and their own order, took boats and nets and fished and caught near 300 salmons. But from that time until Michaelmas day that I was there, which was nine weeks and heard the report of it and saw the poor people's miserable lamentations, they had not seen one salmon in the river. And some of them were in despair that they should never see any more there, affirming it to be God's judgment upon them for the profanation of the Sabbath. Now, what all this shows really is that history and background is important. Uh, we salmon managers spend our time day to day working with things as they are, as we think they've always been. But we have to keep in mind that these large scale changes do happen. And it's not a case of if they happen, but when they happen. And when that happens, we have to change all our assumptions. All the, what we knew about salmon, all we thought we knew about salmon during our time, uh, all has to change, as will all our stock parameters. And in particular, we need to be able to identify when such changes are happening, so not to waste time and resources trying to counteract them. For example, we're trying to restore spring salmon in the 1980s and 90s when the environment had completely changed against them. 